dropping some knowledge and a little love and a little love this this is the fire on your head podcast with your host steve bremner steve bremner, steve bremner missionary to peru and blogger at stevebremner.com the podcast where we tackle gray areas your pastor doesn't talk about ladies and gentlemen steve bremner Greetings and welcome to the show. This is just uh, going to be a simple introduction to my guest appearance on another podcast recently. So depending on when you're catching this, I actually recorded or participated in the recording for this like six months ago or something. And I only mention that because not every show I've ever guested on has taken that long to, to publish. I don't know what, what those guys' um, schedule is like. Christian Hardin and Michael Clark. And uh, I want to get to how I know Michael in a moment because I know I mentioned some things in that podcast such as if you're a subscriber to my podcast, Fire on Your Head, and you listened months ago when I came back after like a three-year hiatus, I mentioned about the possibility of um, traveling to Texas due to, you know, being invited to a, a church as a result of my book on speaking in tongues. Well, you know, I never went. Oh, I th- I'm pretty sure we talked about that. I'm pretty sure we brought it up. I'm pretty sure somewhere in the conversation we were talking about writing and we we're talking about books and I mentioned that example. So I got to give props to Christian for his editing skills because I know that this conversation was longer than 37 minutes <laughs> and that like there's like two hours of my time carved out and, and most of it was not spent, you know, getting set up and talking when the the discussion was over and stuff. So props to Christian for his, his mad editing skills, helping me sound more concise than I, I know I really was. I was just chatting back and forth with JD King tonight because uh, I'm working on my third audio book with him at the time of this intro. Okay, so a couple of things actually, you know, I, I mentioned audio books that are going on. I just found out that Audible released one of my most recent audio productions that is different than most of my audiobook productions, not because it's nearly 10 hours long, which means nothing if you listen to a lot of audio and but the nonfiction books I tend to narrate, this is this is my new record. It's about to be broken uh, down the road too, but as of late, so it's from Desert Streams Ministries. It's the Living Waters Guidebook. I never heard of these, you know, this un- until a year ago when uh, Andrew Comiskey's people reached out to me. Amber Wheeler is the person I had a lot of the communication with. And uh, if you're on the fence about having your own website, if you're on the fence about like putting your writing, your audiobooks, and, you know, just digital things you do on some kind of showcase online, like your own website, if you're on the fence about doing that, then I can pray for you for mental healing. But like, yeah, it's your loss. You're leaving money on the table if you if you don't want to have a place that's not Facebook or LinkedIn for people to reach you. Because that's how Amber reached me, you know, six or seven months before we started working on this book. And uh, and that's where I was introduced to him. But I've learned the hard way. I've just been living under a rock because uh, as I've published on social media, a lot of you have told me about this. So I've got that book. It's the Living Waters guidebook, but an audiobook version of it. So it's me taking you through you know, it's stripped down. It doesn't have the testimonies and the things that the real guidebook has, but each chapter has Andrew himself praying for you. So I think it's about like an hour and a half accumulated of the audio is him praying for the listener. And I love that guy's voice. I'm grateful they hired me to do the audiobook, right? So, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, maybe he's busy and, and whatnot, but anyway, If you've struggled with or you've had issues with sexuality, gender issues, or pornography, whatever the case is, this material is very important. And so that's why I'm taking a few moments to be letting you know about it. And J.D. King, who you've heard on the podcast a couple times now, the most recent would be the one about end times that I did with Jonathan Ammon, who I narrated his book on amillennialism, also around the same time I was working on the Living Waters book. So like JD and I, we worked on his Beast of Revelation book. I just finished recording a book on Ethan O. Allen, who's a lesser known healing evangelist 
in the 1800s than Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake and these people. So, you know, JD had the rights or whatever to that content, cleaned it up, did a character sketch. And almost as soon as we were done, the Beast book hired me to do this one and I enjoyed it. And if you go to my SoundCloud samples or if you're on my website or you go to, you know, you're in my orbit and you're you're anywhere that you can easily go to my SoundCloud playlist, then I've got a clip, a very funny kind of clip that I think is just a great example of this guy, Ethan Allen. There's not a bunch of other stuff like Smith Wigglesworth or these guys out there that is in the public domain and people are going to be making, you know, books about it. So I think JD did good by himself and Christos Publishing getting his hands on that property. And if other books start popping up, you know, take a look at them and see if they're they're in modern English, because if so, then they ripped off JD because he's he's put a lot of work into updating the manuscript and, and putting it in the shape that it's in. So maybe down the road, we'll do a podcast of some kind about public domain works. And uh, I'm now also working on the Smith Wigglesworth book along with JD. So the ever increasing faith, depending on the circles you swim in, you've probably all, already read that book. There's very few versions of it out there in audiobook land plenty of written versions, you know, since it's in the public domain. So like anybody can make a version of it. But JD and I are, are releasing an audiobook version because there's so few versions of it out there that we think this will be a good kingdom business move slash strategy. Also working on Jonathan Brenneman's book, The Trojan Horse of Tithing. And uh, I've got about a third of it recorded. Look for that by maybe September of this year, 2023. I'm just throwing throwing that out there because I've got things on my plate, y'all. That's why I've not been podcasting in, in such a long time and in, in spurts. I just don't have the time for the audio and I do that all at night and sleep in and feel like a yutz when I start my day late in the day and, and, and whatever. So, but I'm getting pumped making these audiobooks and I hope you're enjoying them as much. Oh, and guess what? I've also got this other praying medic book. I've got the manuscript for and I'm reading and at the moment I'm sitting here talking to my microphone, pretending that thousands of you are going to hear me, I'm reading it. Is power and authority made easy? No, made simple. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, so it's my sixth book for him, the sixth book in his Kingdom of God Made Simple series. You know what? You might be listening to this and that book might already be out. Who knows? But anyway, I've got a lot of audio in the pipeline I don't have a very specific way to rope you in if you want to know more about these things to be caught up to date. But anyway, I'm just touching base saying those things. I really wanted to put word out there for you specifically about the Living Waters audiobook, just because I was never into drugs. I was never into alcohol. Sexual issues were vices and problems in my life. And if there's anything I know statistically, it's that an awful lot of you probably would benefit or do need to hear that book or to buy the written version. I get nothing out of it if you go and you sign up for that ministry or, or, or go through their workshops or anything like that. But I encourage you to do so if you want to and need to. So anyway, without any further ado, I share with you this interview that uh, the guys at um, Coffee and Conversations did with me. I I was acquainted with Michael in, in Bible college, just like Chris Bennett, if you want to go back and listen to that interview. Only I don't think I ever talked to Michael, ever. I, I, I think we, we knew each other and were acquainted with each other. If we ran into each other in public, we would know, hey, you that I went to fire with 20 years ago. Like, we, you know, we've been connected on Facebook or social media or whatever. And um, I put myself out there looking for if people wanted to have guests on their podcasts. And he was one of the first people to respond. And there you go. We kind of got talking and got to know each other a bit. So forgive me if you're tired of my voice. This was a very one-sided conversation because they had questions for me. And they normally talk to people in the Knoxville area where they're based. And uh, I was, you know, one of the odd occasions they interview someone remotely who's not like in person or whatever with them. And I appreciate that. I listened to a few of their episodes to see how they roll. And uh, they're doing some good stuff in the Knoxville inner city area. So there you have it. No outro. Just listen to that episode and subscribe to them if you like what they're doing. Wow. 
Welcome to another episode of Coffee and Conversations, where we look at the intersection of relationships, faith, and leadership. I am one of your co-hosts, Michael Clark. And I'm Christian Harden. We're so glad you joined us. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Conversations. So excited that, that you have joined us. And of course, I've got my co-host here in studio. Christian, how you doing? I'm doing good. You know, a little bit of pickleball in the morning, some coffee. Can't go we wrong. We did have staff pickleball. That was great. That was fun. And uh, so I am drinking coffee. I'm actually still drinking coffee left over from my men's small group this morning. Reheated it. I had some Ethiopian so. this morning. Mm, mine's not quite that great. You know, I really like Peruvian coffee. I don't know if you ever had Ooh. it. It's good. High altitude. We will ask our guest today. I see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Super excited to um, have Steve calling in via Skype today. Um, Steve, tell us where you're coming from and love to just have you introduce yourself a little bit. Right. I'm drinking coffee too. It's fantastic. Let's go. <laughs> so, uh, it, thanks for asking. It's, it's no, McDonald's. I'm, I'm in Peru. <laughs> it's <laughs> Arabic of you. I'm, I'm uh, I'm sitting at my desk down here in uh, south of Lima, Peru. Okay. And uh, I, like I said, I'm drinking coffee too because for me it's an early morning. And uh, yeah, that's the that's where I'm calling from. So tell our listeners today just a, a little bit about yourself, kind of um, where your journey in life began, where you kind of grew up, and uh, of course we'd love to hear a little bit of just kind of your spiritual journey, kind of interwoven in that too. Um, and uh, kind of how you've ended up where you're at now. Oh, that's a that's a loaded question. It is. So <laughs> where did my journey part. began? <laughs> right. Well, I am long winded, so you'll have to cut me off and um, <laughs> uh, interrupt me and stuff with specific questions. Okay, I give you sounds, permission sounds great. to try to interrupt me. To try. <laughs> so I I was born I was born in a small town. And no, just kidding. Uh, fast forward about <laughs> twenty years. Um, so I. You and I know each other from like fire school ministry, right? right? Or at least Mm -hmm. we're acquainted that way. Uh, I grew up in like a, you know, conservative Plymouth Brethren uh, type of church. Didn't believe in, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues or, you know, uh, I had people warn me about this one church outside of town that that was pretty crazy. And uh, eventually I learned exciting. So that's the kind of background I came up in. And I got saved at 15 uh, met some, some people who were carpooling and going down to Pensacola and, uh, you know, well, I mean, I'm, I'm skipping ahead a bit, but from where, where, like where, been a part where did of this you church. live? Ah, sorry for that detail. I'm trying to be concise. No, you're good. <laughs> so I grew up in this, I grew up in um, the middle of cottage country, Ontario in mm. Canada. Mm. All sorts of hockey players come from where I'm from Let's go. and, and a few mus- musicians, uh, I have no idea if Sound. anyone would know anymore because this is the 90s, <laughs> right? And uh, okay, so um, yeah, so so my you know small town, maybe like 80,000 people. So carpooling and, uh, from like Ontario, two or three Pentecostal churches. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a long trip. So my last year of high school. So uh, I, I I met these friends in my like my last year of high school or so. Uh, I got to be careful for names because of where a couple of them are sure. nowadays in the world as far as safety goes. And, um, they would come back with like boatloads of videotapes, right? Like, you know, before yeah. internet, before, well, there was, there was internet back then, but before, you know, really being able to podcast and listen to things directly off the internet and whatnot. And I would borrow these tapes. I liked being around these guys, you know, iron sharpening iron. Um, they were, they, they were different than other Christians I knew. And so I wanted to do whatever they were doing. If they were having a prayer meeting, I'll, I'll go to it. It was, it was like that, right? Kind of like an overweight guy hanging around people who go to the gym all the time. It starts to, you know, wear off on you and you, you start to, you know, get better in better shape. Right. So I was like that guy. Um, the, and, uh, so when I finished high school in 2000, uh, me and one of the other guys were planning on going to, it was the Brownsville revival at the time. Right. And as you may know, um, they, there was this split that happened around that time and mm-hmm. it started to become harder to, to communicate and, and get answers from anyone that we, we were talking to. And so I had applied to both schools, right? Like I applied to go to Brownsville and I applied to the fire one and eventually it kind of dawned on me, I want to go to fire because all the people I'd watched on these videos and stuff, mm. that's the, that's the one they went to. But the Brownsville people were 
on top of their game mm. and answering me and calling me and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll keep this in mind. Thanks. And, uh, my friend was, was, you know, waiting on fire to get back to to him. And I was like, yep, I know I'm coming. Uh, like, like I just knew in my nowhere, this is where I'm supposed to go next in life and whatever. And, and, um, and I'll keep in mind, I'd only grown up in this this one place in Ontario. I'd never really traveled much. I've I've been, I, I know more outside of Canada than I do like just my own province, right? So um, this is like you know I'm 20. I go down to Florida, and it dawns on me now as we're talking that was when 9/11 happened. Yes. Uh, so like my, so my first semester, like I'm going away to another country for Bible school, and it's a different type of place. You know, going from like. Plymouth Brethren to Charismatic. Yes. Um, anyway, then um, I wound up going to, to Holland because this guy, Greg Montella, and a few other people, um, they'd gotten started a base there and they would come back and share what's going on. And something just, you know, struck a chord with me where it's like, okay, when I'm done school here, I'm going to go there if they'll have me, you know, if they'll, if they still, you know, it's still the place to go by that time. And um, so I would talk with uh, Greg every time he was visiting and stuff. And he said something once like, you know, we go into these schools and we lead kids to Jesus, um, but we need people to, to disciple them. You know, we've got all these evangelists, but we need teachers. And I'm like, ah, oh, that sounds great because I suck at like evangelism. And um, but I love to teach and people mm -hmm. keep telling me, oh, you're obviously a teacher. You're you, and um, so like the whole Paul water or one of them plants and the other waters. Right. Like I feel like I'm a I'm a waterer. You know, I can I can if that's what you need, then I'm coming. And um and I get there and that team was like in dire straits and falls apart. And I, I joke that like, I, as soon as I came over, that stuff ended, <laughs> took a trip back, back down to Charlotte and got my bearings and, and wound up uh, joining their mission agency and going back to Holland, but moving to a different city and working with Dutch people who I knew weren't going to really go anywhere. Like, <laughs> you know, it's their country there. They're, they're going to mm. be here a while. And um, so if there's any fights or splits or whatever, then, you know, you have to work it out because this is like there's there's nowhere to go or whatever you can't just not not saying that people packed up and, and left but like um so anyway uh that la that lasted about a year a year and a half and it was just not not the right fit for me either and um i was just talking to dan slavin last night who who was a part of that team at the time and he he was in the city that that, that all the fire people were um initially and we would skype every night well, not every night but we would skype like more than once a week and then that's where we wound up starting a, a podcast and, and at the time we would podcast and like we would record it and put it online specifically just for other dutch people we knew in other cities who would not be able to come to bible studies or things we were doing but would listen to whatever we were discussing and talking about and so that's where that started so you used your first podcast for digital discipleship <laughs> yeah exactly that's awesome that's cool Maybe we should like change the focus where it's not, we're not just doing this for like our, our Dutch friends. Right. But like a mm. more of a global thing and whatever. And then as I like around, um, uh, going through a process to like, just basically leave and, uh, took a trip to Peru with my pastor in Canada. Um, it dawned me like, yeah, we need to change the name if I'm going to not be in hall. Like if, and then, um, around that same time, I think like the next year, Dan, uh, went back to the States and went back to school. So it's like, if we're both not in the Netherlands, we can't really be doing a podcast that's like, <laughs> you know, called fire Netherlands or whatever. Yeah. But no, we started our podcast from like, just as part of discipleship as part of the, uh, um, reaching people. We're not going to talk to see, you know, be face to face with. And, um, you know, with a very small vision at the, at the outset, yes. but it's, uh, it's funny because it became a big part of like, like I was just telling him last night, like, cause we only did it for like a year or two, but like this thing is a big part of my life in the sense that I learned all these things I've learned about audio and, mm. and then eventually doing audio books and, you know, speaking and, um, uh, learning how to use certain equipment. Uh, it's where it's, it's kind of tied into writing and then eventually, you know, sure. turning blogs into books and, and then, you know, books and impacting people and helping other people for money and tent making. So yeah. Anyway, wow. my question was loaded. I hope I no, didn't go that's too great. Long. So I, I hear a little bit of um, part of what you shared there that you then ended up going on a trip with your pastor from Canada. 
to Peru. Um, is that was that the start of you were already kind of feeling restless with the the team you were part of there in the Netherlands? But is that what then led you to um, to where you're at now? Yeah, yeah. I, I was listening to another interview I did last night to kind of prepare myself for today, and I was reminded that um, when I spoke with my pastor after that year of being in Rotterdam, the other the other city, the, so like the second time or the the second major chunk of my time in uh, Holland, um, I was telling him how I was doing stuff. Uh, answering any questions he asked me. And then when we were done, he was like, Steve, you don't believe what you're telling me. And I remember being like, what do you mean? Like, you know, because like old people tend to know better than us. Like, you know, like as far as things go, like whatever I was saying, he, he, you know, was seeing through it. And I was like, what, what, what do you mean? Like, well, is something wrong? Like, are you doing all right? And, um, and so he, he kind of got me to kind of think about and see, like, I, I might not have really, had vision about like what I wanted to be doing there anymore, or maybe, maybe I didn't at the, at the outset, I don't know, but, um, he was, he was, he was helpful at, at getting me to like, kind of determine like, do I want to go back and do another year of this? Like, you know, and, um, and the answer was no, <laughs> like, of yeah. course not. And, um, like, I like, um, things, you know, may not have gone as well as I wanted, or there was other, you know, considerations and, uh, you know, moving off to another culture and all that kind of stuff is not necessarily for everyone. Is it for me? I don't know. So he recommended not going back or not committing to going back, you know, cause I was in Canada for that, um, that, you know, itinerating or doing the trip to Charlotte and stuff and fundraising. And I suck, I sucked at it. Like I was ne- I've never been good at fundraising. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe the problem is I'm just in the wrong location. And, uh, once I, you know, figure out what I want to do, if it's, if it's missions, then maybe I'll, I'll, you know, that'll, that'll help lift me up to, you know, be able to do a better job at that if I want to really do this for, for now. And keep in mind, like, you know, I'm in my late twenties, so it's not like I plan on doing it for the rest of my life. You know, at that age, sure you, you remember like long term is like a few years. Right. So, um, that's right. And so he, rec- so he recommends not going back to Holland, but to take uh, a break and stay, stay put. And then, go with him on his next trip to Peru, which was coming up in the spring. And so I did. Um, and then when I left his office, I remember knowing, okay, Peru's the next place I'm going to live. And, uh, but I had met these other people, Mark and Anna Burgess, uh, sometime toward the end of that or, or hmm. overlapping with this. And, um, they were doing a lot more of what I wanted to be doing as far as discipleship, as far as like, hmm. You know, not like I didn't have this mentality, like I want to do house churches, not real, you know, in a building church and whatever. Mm-hmm. But they were they were doing a lot more like of this relational stuff that like I was definitely seeing the deficit in my own mm. ministry. And um, and it was funny as I I introduced these two guys, uh, my my former leader and then and Mark and it just didn't go well at all. And they were looking at each other like, what? Like, you know, they're, they're asking each other questions and. And uh, when my leader left, um, you know, Mark was like, hey, Steve, do you got a minute? And um, uh, I was like, yeah, sure. He goes, so that that's that's your your leader, right? Like, you're nothing like him. I don't I don't know what I thought was going to happen. But like, mm. you two are nothing. You two are nothing alike. How, how did you wind up? Um, how did you wind up here together? I, I lived in this apartment in like a tourist kind of area of town. A lot easier to kind of integrate into the culture here if you're like, you know, you, you come just from like Canada or whatever. But Mark and Anna were further south where I am now. And I knew like, well, if I'm, I'm going to do stuff with them, I'll probably have to move down there uh, and to be closer. And um, instead of taking like, you know, hour long commutes and stuff. Mm. And uh, so eventually I did and I met my wife here. Um, I've, I don't, I'm not in the same house, but I've been in this like neighborhood for the last like 10 years still wow. working with people been you know it's not without its bumps in the road like you guys sure. know from any industry or whatever but definitely a little more suited to my personality and sensibilities and stuff but and you married a peruvian i i did That's whether that was a good idea or not well, um, <laughs> i hope i hope you both feel like it was a good idea <laughs> well i i joke but i but there's some seriousness to it because i after getting married and and you know mm-hmm. I, I heard from people that um intercultural marriages are are more, I, I wouldn't know the difference, right? Cause I've only been married once. And, um, but I was told like intercultural marriages are harder than sure. normal culture, like same culture marriages. So I guess it's true, <laughs> but sometimes, and sometimes I'm like, yep, yeah, it's true. You know? Sure. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, when you get married, you already are bringing your own family cultures to it, even if you're in the same culture. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it just magnifies, I'm sure. But yeah, but I, what's, mean, what's it's, funny, I think it's very sorry, beautiful. I I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you because I was just talking for a long time already. But what's funny is I met her because of this new uh, kind of ministry I joined. And it was just funny how fast all sorts of other things fell into place, mm. um, which you know, don't automatically validate or guarantee like you've sure. made the right decision at something. Sure. But it was like, it was, it made it easier to feel like, okay, you know, maybe the first couple of years here, we're just kind of like, I don't know, learning and, you know, and, and I had this self doubt, like maybe I suck and I, I am difficult to work with or something. I don't feel like I am, but maybe that is how other people feel. Cause it didn't go well in, in, in Holland with that first mm. year. And then he, and then here I am in, um, in Peru, having, but, but I felt like in Peru, some of the challenges I was having here were different. And, and so, you know, I had to talk to Dr. Peters about like, well, what's going on? Like, are you, and you know, and he, he I don't, I don't want to talk bad about anyone. Right. But he was like, are you sure you're called to the mission field? Hmm. Like, are you really called? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Wow. I, I don't know anymore. <laughs> like maybe if y'all, if all of you are telling me I'm not, then maybe I'm not. I, wow. don't know. I mean, you know, and I've, I've met all sorts of missionaries that have had to come off the, the mission field or, yeah. um, there was, a, you know, this one family I know where they had like this one church that was a huge part of their budget. And that church said, now nah, we're done. And they, they, they scrambled and had to, mm. you know, move back to the States. And I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to let myself wow. be in that position. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if I feel God's, if I, you know, for many years I felt like I'm called here, so I'm not going to let man pull the plug on me if God's the one who's put me here yeah. and I've, yeah. you know, and, it, and then in my walk with him and in my relationship with him, I've, I've learned the things I've learned and he's taught me the things he's taught me and I have these skills that he's given me and I'm using them to provide for my family and be here and stuff. So it's like, okay. So, you know, I look back at that phone call or that yeah. Skype call rather, maybe I, maybe I'm not a so-called missionary in their paradigm. <laughs> you know sure, what I mean? With the, sure. um, and, uh, but I'm this other thing, but whatever God was that leading is. you into that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, whatever it is God's called me to do, if the word is not to, to use missionary, then I'm fine with that. Two and, big, um, two big questions, Steve, as you're talking about that, <laughs> that, that really come to mind. One, I'm really curious. I'd, I'd love for you to paint the picture or define for us, like what discipleship looks like for you that you've become passionate about that drew you to the community and work that you're now a part of with Mark and, um, so what, what did that look like? Cause you've experienced a number of different things, um, from where you, where you uh, got saved at age 15, uh, back home to going to a Bible school, then to trying to work with a team in the Netherlands, working with a team in Peru, f still forming all that and finding, you know what, I, I think I'm a better fit here. This is really what I'm passionate about. Um, what does that look like for you? How, and then what is your role? What are, what are you doing in that? Okay. So I still, I still don't know what I'm supposed to do when I grow up. Right. But, um, <laughs> me either, but, but I'm, but the, the, the groove that I found myself in, uh, it looks like this, right? So, um, uh, I, I gotta think of how to share this in a way that's vague to not implicate the guilty. Um, when, so these, so those two leaders, I like when I introduced them, right? Like, like, I think this kind of summarizes, um, how I felt. Um, so my previous leader, he's like asking Mark, uh, what, what books do you use? What courses do you use for discipleship? Hmm. And you know, Mark, Mark's looking at him like, huh? Hmm. There's no courses. We, we have people in our homes. We, um, hmm. you know, we, we have meals together. We do things together. Um, one of the big things we do nowadays, like we play poker every, like men, the men <laughs> in our community, like we play poker on like, uh, every other Sunday night, um, you know, like there, there, there's not like a discipleship course. It's like discipleship happens. Like, you know, Jesus was mm. taking his disciples places with them and doing things. And, um, you know, I, I noticed my first year or so here that like, you know, Mark would ask me to come with him, like to go pick up his kid from school or go run errands. But it was just more like the mentality that um, mm. discipleship, di discipleship, like a program rather than um, relationships and, um, you know, living life together and doing things yeah. together with people. And I remember like our, our team meetings that, that first year or two I was here, um, that all of us were single and there was like one married couple 
And we were told, okay, find people to spend time with this week, minimum two mm-hmm. hours. And it, it, I'm not talking about like oh, that's church so or a Bible study or something, but like just, you know, two at minimum two hours of your time, it can be like four half hours, you know, with, you know, four different people, or it could be like mm-hmm. one, two hour, you know, with the same person, whatever, but just be intentionally looking for how you like somebody who's not as far along in the faith as you are, or they might not even be saved at all yet. And you're pouring yourself into them. You're spending time with them. That's so good. I was, I was having a conversation uh, just probably about a month ago with a missions pastor from a large church here in town, um, a Baptist church, 8,000 plus members. Um, he came off the field from leading the base in England with uh, the International Mission, Mission Board there. And, you know, one of the things that we were talking about, because he is so interested in just disciple making, he's like, I want to be a part of disciple making movements. And there's just something about institutionalizing things like that, that it automatically loses its grit and effectiveness. And that's what we were just talking about, about how, how even church planning, like there's like this certain plateau you reach and it's like, it, you know, yes, we want to do things excellent. Yes, we want to do things well, but it's got to maintain that grit relationship. I mean, somehow it like, for me, I look at Jesus, I'm like, he's grassroots by model like intentionally grassroots, intentionally relational, like that, that's how it was going to work. Exactly. I look at the same thing with what we do here and it's like, man, we can have a lot of, a lot of bigger infrastructure and and facilities and things like that. I'm like, no, it would reduce our effectiveness. It absolutely would reduce our discipleship effectiveness. Every Paul, you Mm -hmm. know, needs a Timothy and every Timothy needs a Paul. And, um, there's, you know, you've got someone, you know, if you're doing it right, you're, you're, you're not, you've, you never arrive. You're getting poured into by someone and you're pouring into someone and that's not institutional, right? That's just kind of like, um, it should just be happening. You've got people in your life that are older and wiser and you're learning from. And so we've got to be mindful and careful yeah. who we're going to listen to. And then yeah. the same thing, like who we're going to do that for. And so I look at it like, a, you know, a pastor on Sunday morning, once a week speaking to 8,000 people doesn't do or provide that necessity. Definitely. I want to come to my second question, but before we do, my co-host Christian is going to take this next segment. We're going to have a little bit of fun here, Steve. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Um, yes. So this is the rapid fire portion of the show where the questions get faster and the answers probably, <gasps> they'll stay a little bit the same. They'll, they'll be slow. We want to hear you talk. Um, so my first question is, do you like movies? Do you like, do you watch movies? <sighs> I do like movies. I am a bit of a couch potato as far as when my like time off or, you know, He'll like breaks this question. are Good. concerned. Good. So this one, I know, uh, I've, got, I've got the questions, send them to me. Sweet. <laughs> well, so, but I, but I phrase it in a certain way. So I want to know your favorite movie, but it's the type of movie where you come in, you turn on the TV and it's like halfway through the movie, but you don't care. You're going to watch it because it's your favorite movie. See, I don't have one particular favorite movie. Mm. You can give me a but couple. if it's but something that's on that you, that you're talking about because I've listened to a couple of your podcasts to see what other people say. Yeah. Um any Indiana Jones movie. Like if huh. I turn on the TV. Okay. Um something that like it doesn't, you know, the the plot's not too hard to follow. You yep. don't need to watch it from the beginning. So like any of these Indiana Jones movies. Huh. Those are um, fun. Those are fun. Marvel you know, Marvel type of superhero movies. And Ian Jones. And they're bringing it back. They are. They're doing another one. My kids think I'm going to be in it somehow. Really? (laughs) Yeah, because when we went to Disney, I was like in the Uh, Indiana Jones on the stage, and they think that that was part of the new movie. I'm like, uh, no no kids. They they actually did They still do that. They do. They still do that, do they? They Because I remember that when I was a kid. They do. We saw that. Yep. Now my kids get to have the same memory. That's pretty cool. Um, Okay. The, my next question is your go-to comfort food. So it's been a long day, uh, maybe maybe a good week, or it could be a rough week, and you just kind of want some comfort food to either celebrate or mm. uh, just kind of make you feel better. And where is this coming from? What Yeah, what comfort? Is it going to be Canadian comfort? Peruvian mm. comfort? How about both? Maybe. I kind of want to hear both. Yeah, like, what, what are you picking? Okay, so I would – my wife would tell you that I just constantly eat wraps – so like pitas or shawarmas or uh, burritos. Like I just, um, she jokes that like I won't, I don't eat things unless it's like wrapped up in like a pita or something. Nice, um, easy to hold. 
so I don't know if that's true that I would say that's my comfort food as much as like, um, I'm on a, uh, I don't know if you, you can tell cause we're not on video, but I'm losing weight. I'm, I'm working out and eating better. And so I like the, just the portions are all figured out. Like if you just make mm. the thing, it's less difficult to yep. overindulge if it's just, it comes in this set size and whatever. And then the final rapid fire question is your favorite, uh, outdoor activity. Hmm. So if you're working out, uh, do you do you like go on runs or you from Canada? A couch potato. Yeah, it's yeah it's so a couch potato. No, do you play I, hockey? No, I, no, 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 no. Um, no, when I say I'm lazy and I'm a couch potato, that's like my off time. Like I work hard when you rest, and yeah, and then re- I rest hard. And um, so my my workout, like I go to a gym. Like I I've lived near the beach for like ten years, mm. and I if I if I were disciplined to go running on the beach, I would have been doing it already. But the psychology <laughs> of pay, the psychology of like I pay and I have a membership and I have access to all this equipment, um, I'm gonna go do it. So I'm not wasting my time and my my you know membership money. Right. Um. Like I I more so whenever I, I I'm a member at a gym, I I get in better shape because just the living near the beach is not enough to mm-hmm. take advantage of the beach and go running. Right. Um, so outdoor activity, that was what your question was. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know that I have one per, per se and, but I do enjoy, um, uh, you know, I walk a lot. <laughs> like I just, yeah. Yeah. um, if it, if, if I could, you know, if something's going to take a half hour to walk to, then for me, that's the, the, right amount of time that like, okay, I'll walk instead of taking the bus or driving yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, um, so I, I, I don't have an activity. I'd have to think no. about it some well, more, but good. that, that I comes to mind. That's a, that's a real thing. Yeah. I love walking. And it helps me listen to things. It helps, yep. you know, I listen to audiobooks or, or podcasts. I do the same. So it's like, so <laughs> Steve, tell us a little bit more about like, you were talking about being discipled, uh, in tent making and, and realizing that, um, you wanted to kind of figure out how not to be dependent upon just outside support as a missionary and, or someone doing ministry in another country, but how can you continue to make a livelihood? And you figured out some digital ways to do that. Uh, what are some of those things mm-hmm. that you're doing, you're doing well, um, that you're growing into? Right. So like I'm, I'm still bivocational, but the, the majority or like a large portion of, of, you know, our support, our, our, or sorry, sustenance is, is from the tent making. It is from, stuff that like, you know, we got to worry about what country wants to tax me, whatever. And, um, but we still, we still receive some support. Right. And now, uh, where I fell into that groove is definitely with writing skills. Um, you know, I've okay. ghostwritten, I've, I've done copywriting for people. Mm-hmm. And what I, what I first was doing was, you know, I'd been blogging for free you know, on my own kind of website and stuff for many years. And I started to encounter people who were like, I would love to, you know, they'd say things like, I would love to do what you're doing. I don't have the time or I don't know how or whatever. I'd rather just pay someone. And I'm like, huh? Like, you know what I mean? Like I heard what you just said and, um, allow me to present myself. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, you said you'd rather pay someone. I'm someone. And, um, like like I started stumbling upon these kind of ideas or, um, because, you know, for a long time I did try to do you know, living on support and having the right amount. And I never did. And, and I'd like, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about food and uh, shelter. And, um, so I, you know, start thinking up kind of ideas or, um, I, I start out doing like WordPress websites for some people like okay. other missionaries or other, yeah. other people where it was pretty easy. Cause I already knew how to do it. Sure. But then I would start, but then I'd start encountering people who wanted like a Ferrari website for yeah. like Honda Accord budget. Uh-huh. And it was just, just too much stress. Right. Like, and, um, uh, and then I learned the hard way that like, no, uh, like other people can make good money doing websites for people. And I was charging crap and, um, already, uh, you know, low balling myself, but then, um, eventually, uh, the writing. So, um, this guy that was like discipling me in digital, you know, stuff, um, for a while he tried to kind of launch a business or something related to, uh, like this is like 10 years ago now, f- something phone related and mobile marketing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ba- back then it wasn't as ubiquitous as now, but it was obviously going in this direction. And, um, you know, 
turning people's websites into like a more mobile friendly yeah. website. So it would look good on a phone, more responsive, um, yeah. you know, yeah. Ads and things for, you know, digital devices and things. And so he, you know, he hired me to basically write this report. Like, you know, I interviewed him and then go and make a report and he was giving it away on his website and, you know, doing a webinar and, you know, people would sign up to work with him and stuff. And so I was like on this kind of retainer hmm. and, and he, he, he would pay me. Uh, and that was kind of like a huge part of my support for like that year. Like as I look back on that time. Um, and then one day he was like, uh, he made me listen to this webinar and writing Kindle books. And um, the way I tell the story is is not that inaccurate, but I got mad watching this webinar hmm. of like these biz- these business people who were like, yeah, I go to Craigslist and I hire someone to write a report and then I just kind of get a cover made and I put it on Amazon and I sell it as a, a Kindle book and I, I've got like 40 of them and, uh, and I'm, I've got this like, you know, empire, you know, this little, and I'm like getting angry, not because like, like I think they're doing anything wrong, but I'm like, if people who aren't writers can make money with like mm. Kindle books, then why am I not when I am a writer? Like when I'm wow. like, why did I never think of this before? You know, so that's mm. what I, I, uh, I, I, I basically put together my, my first one, um, on divine healing. Cause I already had all these blog posts that I knew mm-hmm. got a lot of traffic. Uh, people were reading and, and, you know, they made for good podcast discussions. So I tested the waters with that first just to, learn the lay of the land, so to speak. Some people don't write a book because of their lack of confidence, but I often work with people who they have too much confidence and you have to pull them back to like realistic expectations. Mm. And so I, so like I, I, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to support myself with like book royalties. And it's like, no, it's, you know, probably a few years of pouring uh, work into like marketing and, and, you know, doing the, the, the making a good finished product. Mm. And it was probably like five years before I started profiting from books of mine. And then if um, that's self-publishing, right? Yeah. And, um, and then I had someone basically approach me. So there's pros and cons to doing, um, being published. Like you can say I'm published and there's a credibility and people think that's amazing or something, but then you also don't know things <laughs> mm-hmm. like you don't know, like, Oh, but somebody there, my book is on sale. Oh, I didn't know that. Or, um, uh, um, you know, I don't have permission to do things. So I've got these books out there and I started the same thing. I started having people who were like, um, they, you know, ask me for advice and help and whatever. And I realized at some point, I just don't have time to help everyone that asks me, <gasps> why don't I chart? Like, why don't I have a service? Sure, like, why don't I, sure. um, so along the way I, uh, I, I wound up paying handsomely for some, you know, mentoring and coaching. Um, uh, do you know Chris Evans? Yeah, uh, I do. Yeah. So his, him and Taylor Welch, I guess you might know him too. Mm-hmm. Um, or if not, then just humor me. <laughs> and um, so like I, I joined the client kit, this thing they started uh, as part of traffic and funnels. And um, I, I basically like, you know, my first call with a guy who was like my, my mentor in that program and, and we're kind of going over like my, my business plan and you know, what I could offer with books and stuff. And he's like, Steve, you need to add like a zero to your price. Wow. Like, <gasps> well, nobody's going to pay Steve add a zero. If you, if you want to really like, you know, reach your goals and the things you told me and when, wow. um, you're not going to, you're not going to do it at like, you know, having like a hundred people pay a little bit is useless compared to having like 10 people pay a bit more or like one big client. Like, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and so I, you know, I was starting to see that like I was working with other broke Christians and, um, mm. you know, overextending myself for like peanuts because yeah. I'm like, well, better to have, better something than nothing. Well, in light of our time, I, I want to ask one last question, but if you could answer it in just a couple of minutes, um, I'll try, I'll try. Yes, uh, <laughs> we're, we're wrapping up, but, uh, what would you go back and tell your 21 year old self? Don't take out your mutual funds to pay for tuition at fire. <laughs> oh man. That's a tough lesson learned or, or, in, or invest like, you know, invest yeah. already, um, in, in things. Just something like that. Yeah. Um, so something financial. 20, um, yes. Because that's definitely, you know, uh, you know, like there's there's still traces of like a poverty mentality I have mm. from years of being on the field and broke and whatever. And I think even in the church, a lot of the body of Christ has an unhealthy 
relationship to money. Sure. So if, if it's not, if it's not like poverty as a virtue, then it's like the prosperity, um, extreme, you know, like, um, you know, you know what I mean? Like the, that so-called prosperity gospel. And so I, I would go back probably and, and tell myself, no, don't, don't do that. Like, yeah. uh, it's not, it's not like I would be affluent or something off of whatever that mutual fund would be today. But just the idea of, of, um, mm. sowing things that reap later sure. as far as the findings, I, I really wish I'd, um, had better sense back then, than. I would do, I, you know, that's what I go back and tell myself, right? That's good. That, is, so that, something, that was something, not expected. Something. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us and getting up early in Peru to join us here live uh, <laughs> to record. And um, But we're so grateful for our listeners as well that I'm sure have been blessed uh, to hear your story and just how unique it is and how God's using you uh, in a community of discipleship and, and relationship and uh, sometimes that looks like poker every other Sunday, and sometimes that <laughs> yeah. um, it looks like tent making to uh, be to be present. So super excited to just to have this um, for our listeners as well. And so, listeners, if you're on now and you want to reach out to us, podcast at kiko k i c k o dot org. You can reach out to us and uh, let us know uh, what you thought about today's and what you would like to hear in the. Future.